Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the second of the MIEE events sessions from Turn It On. It's good to see some of you back here this afternoon. Had a lot of people say that as school has got busier, uh, they are going to try and drop in. So I expect to see people appearing during the session. So don't let that surprise you. Just a reminder that we are going to be recording this as normal because we will post it in the team so that you've got the video available to watch back. Or if anybody isn't able to make it here today in the end, they can come and watch it afterwards. Just a reminder that this will also be posted to the Turn It On YouTube channel. So anything that you say or if you switch your camera on, you will be recorded and then that will be publicly made available. Today we have a session of two halves. The first half I am going to be covering some of the questions that have arrived in between the course and I thought I'd bundle them together and address the first batch today. That will approximately take us up to half past four and then at half past four we've got Nick Clark joining us and he will take over the session from that point and he'll be sharing his insights into the journey of being an MIEE, the ability it gave him to engage in digital transformation in his school and helping the wider community that he works with and also that the, the opportunities and the doors that it opens up moving forward so he will join us in the second half and cover all those areas and more he may also show you some really useful apps from office 365 that he thinks have a lot of impact not just in the classroom but across the wider school the session today will also bring in many elements of what we've been discussing so far so the focus is going to be on the first half how to make your application what to do with that application how to make it as strong as possible if you're submitting it if you're not it might give you an insight into if you want to do this in a subsequent year just exactly what's involved uh, so that's the MIEE application and I'll be covering that and then the MIEE journey is where Nick will come in and there'll be an opportunity for questions throughout and also please if you're already doing something or you've tried something within your school and you found success with it or you've found it you've got so far and you just don't know where to go next talk about it be really open we are a community you can say anything you like here it's not going to go any further uh, it'd be good just to support each other and share those ideas so something you're doing may well be really applicable for their school as well so the application itself now most people have told me that they've got through stage one now and that is to go to the microsoft education center and create yourself an account that can be with your school email address that you have been provided with or it could be with a personal account the mech or the microsoft education center isn't picky you can do it either way once you've done that, you will have either completed some courses on your own and earned 1000 points, or you may have used the code that we shared during the last session. If you weren't in the last session, the recording has the code on it. If you've gone to pick up the code, all you will need to do is once you're logged in by signing in in the top right hand corner there, you'll have a pop up box and the second option down says redeem code. If you pop the code in that we've shared with you in the previous session, you'll automatically be awarded a thousand points for joining the accessibility tools that we looked at last time. And that will make you instantly an MIE. And that'll be the first tick in your MIE application without a great deal of effort, because I appreciate you've all got huge workloads and it really is really hard. I remember that one as a full time teacher to find even a second and day beyond your daily duties to go and do extra things. So we've gifted you that last time uh, and you can always get that there. We are sticking very firmly through today with the aims that we set out at the beginning of the course. We want to help you to make your classrooms more accessible, regardless of educational phase or differentiation required for a pupil. We want to show you how the tools in Microsoft 365 can really improve that and make it easy. We're also thinking about how we can make that learning really, really engaging, whether we're dealing with younger pupils, key stage one, key stage two, right the way through to students in sixth form. 
it's quite transferable in the in the tools that you've got available there and it's just thinking about how you adapt them and present them you may not use all the functions you may only touch upon small parts of it but it does have something to offer regardless of age group and as we've already said we are really keen on making sure that teacher workloads are not increased through this course and if anything you can pick up something to make it easier or more efficient to work or you can get the technology to take care of a job that maybe you had to undertake manually so with all those things we are trying to still focus on that mantra of those three points and make sure that you are working through as quickly and as easily as possible the four questions which yes they are going to be there if you're going to answer them the why do you consider yourself to be an MIEE is the bit reflective about you. It should explain a little bit of your background, where you currently are and your journey. Talk about your aspirations for the transformation. Then the question two is to describe how you've taken the technologies. Maybe it's something we've covered in one of the sessions. Maybe you've been using it in your school and you were already engaging with it prior to starting the MIE sessions with us. It really doesn't matter but you need to get in as many as possible. And what we'll look at in a moment is an example of one of the previous MIE applications that were successful in getting through and getting qualified. And we can look at how that translates into a real application. For question three, you need to think about that wider community and your colleagues either in the school and across the school or that also is something that microsoft will take on board that if you've got an outreach role in your school maybe you are part of the year seven team and you're in a secondary and you work with the intake of the year sixes from your feeder primary schools however it is whatever your role is talk about if you find a way to do something uh, and that's made life easier or it's made it more efficient or it's transformed the way that you work with someone. So it could be something as simple as in the summer term, you are in year six and you're working with the secondary in the area and you're looking at transferring information. You decide that actually you're going to achieve that by using a form instead of getting around a table and filling in a paper form. You might think that's a really obvious thing, but that's the sorts of ideas that Microsoft want to see. You just need to have quite a few of them. But it's about that working smartly with the technology you've got to try and make life easier for everyone and make sure you've illustrated that as clearly as possible. And then question four is where Nick will come in this afternoon because he's gone all the way through being an MIEE. He's been out of mainstream education for a while and working in the private sector, but firmly been linked with going back and working with schools. And he'll talk to you just about how that the MIEE qualification opened up doors and how he came to by chance meet someone uh, and that led to much bigger things uh, in, in initially that was within the school and then outside the school. The time frame still stands. Uh, I met with Microsoft yesterday. They wanted me to emphasize to everybody we've got along on these sessions that July the 15th is the absolute cutoff. You can put it in on that day, but make sure it does go in and you get a submission receipt. You will get that after you pop it in through that portal. I would advise, and I know we're all busy people, if you've got any way of trying to start building the skeleton of that from any time now onwards, I've spoken previously about keeping a document somewhere. It could be a one note where you're just jotting down ideas or you're popping a, a note down about something you could include. Maybe it's an evidence of what you've been doing. Maybe it's the impact across the wider community. And then just gradually build those out. If you're going to record a video, I know last year a few people that recorded videos tried to do that in the final week and they didn't attempt the recording until the final week and then they found out that they needed something switched on or a piece of software installed on their computer because it was it was managed by someone on their network so try a video recording even if it's just a dummy of you doing 30 seconds just to check the technology works so that once you've got your script of what you're going to discuss if you're going for the video uh, a submission that that does work and you can just get that in swiftly and smoothly if you're building your sway some people started jotting those notes in the sway and said other people use things like one notes uh, and they used it that way whichever works for you good old pen and paper for all it matters but the final thing needs to be the two minute video or the sway uh, and you can choose how that goes in we had a discussion with jen king over in microsoft and she has assured us that they're already gathering their independent panel to review the submissions again for this year 
uh, and it, they are shaping up quite nicely. All of those people on that independent panel are truly independent. They're not Microsoft employees. They do have an educational background and they are from a global background as well. They're not just UK based. Uh, they are in other countries around the world and, and they will very strictly use those four questions and the criteria that we've been looking at during the session so far to grade and assess what you've submitted. It is going to be slightly more rigorous than last year, but as long as you're really thorough in the preparation and the execution of your application, it will be absolutely fine. So what I think we'll do is we'll pop over and have a look at one of those real applications and just look at how somebody structured it from one of the previous cohorts. While I'm swapping screens, has anybody got any questions in relation to anything we've covered so far? No, OK, let me just share that screen with you. So in a second, once it syncs across, you'll see somebody from the 2019-2020 cohort. Uh, and this is their sway that they submitted to Microsoft. This was a successful sway. So I know that some of the questions coming in, they haven't gone publicly on the MIEE teams. Don't be, don't be frightened to put something public because actually, very commonly I get emails from a number of different people asking the same question and you are all thinking the same thing or you're all facing the same question marks in your head so please throw it on there one of the things that I still like to see happening is people supporting each other and don't be frightened to say oh no I'm doing it this way or I've got an idea of how I've done that way uh, even if you drop a screenshot in or a quick sentence you'll be amazed how much it can support other people in being successful in what they're doing in their schools so we scroll down the MIEE expert, we'll get to the fact this is uh, Laura's submission and Laura set the scene and really this is the question one section. I told you at the beginning it could be a paragraph. I probably would make sure that it's uh, is, is detailed. This was before the current assessment criteria, so do set the scene with you. Set a little bit of your background where you've been to. It doesn't have to be all writing based. As you see, Laura here has used pictures. She's also used excerpts from other sways, so she's hosted a sway within a sway. She's tried to demonstrate that she's become an MIE, uh, and she did that at a a venue where she went in and worked with Microsoft but get that in there she got tweeted about so she's included that she's also talked about some of the people she's worked with and she's then included part of her social blog on her Twitter to show what she's been doing and how she's been trying to spread the word even before she's embarked upon trying to become qualified to be an MIEE she's talking about what she's done with the qualification and the network of people that she's been exposed to so far so I can't emphasize enough even if you think something's trivial do consider it and what well, does it show you in a light that you've been trying to achieve things already? Were you doing something before you embarked upon this journey? And make sure that it comes across in the beginning of your application. What do you stand for? What have you been doing? And what skills have you got so far? Talk about it. Do talk about the fact that you completed the MEC course. Talk about the fact that you got your MIE status. Yes, it can be checked against the email address that you're using for your submission, but make it really easy for the assessment panel to tick that box and know that you've already got that thousand points and you've got the MIEE badge and anything you did with it on that year's journey. For instance, in this instance, we've got Laura here and what Laura did is she started implementing teams across her school quite early on, way before obviously the pandemic hit. She saw the power within her department to get everybody together and she came from a science background and start to build the eight, I think it was eight teachers from memory that she had in her secondary science department from using that effectively as a small community. And what she wanted to do was then showcase that to the leadership team in the school and say, look, here we are, we'll be a, a leading beacon in the school. This is how we're successfully working together. This is how we're sharing resources. And in the end, they got permission to start to use this with a select group of students that were sixth form based because they were mature enough to be considered to, to have a go at using it. And she's not demonstrated just how successful it could be with staff, but also the impact it could positively have with students. Something we haven't focused on yet is the Wakelet application. Wakelet, a bit like Flipgrid, is something that Microsoft 
purchased uh, but it sits in its own product but it is linked to m365 and the suite if you want to go and discover wakelets there are courses on the microsoft education center you can undertake to find out a bit more but in this instance laura decided to become a wakelet ambassador because she got so impressed with producing wakelets and the ease of accessibility for the students that she was teaching so this section here would refer to the question one could be all text but i would say as the as the old adage goes a picture is worth a thousand uh, words so make sure that you do include a few pictures to evidence what you've done so far and just how that is translating into how you started your journey it's the scene setting that we would all do moving down then uh you are going to start to look at the other three questions the digital transformation the working with the wider community and where you'd like to be after you've become a qualified MIEE it doesn't have to run in that order as long as everything is contained within your sway or your video so here Laura starts to try and explain why she thought she was an MIEE why she was in that mindset how she was approaching that change management in her own teaching but also how that was then impacting across her department as i said she's a science teacher uh, and that she gave some very clear examples of how she was using one note as a medium to capture and centralize learning resources for the students who she was working with she decided is one of her missions was that they were going to not become paperless but she was going to try and move them away from her dependence upon paper there was also an eco element to this as well which drove her her application where they she would use things like office lens to grab a copy of something and pop it into one note and annotate over the top she'd actively encourage the students to be working collaboratively on one note so she put things into the collaboration space on one note quite frequently and get the students to to bring their ideas together in there but the driving the fact that that one note is then there to support everybody thereafter and that they can refer back to it it's not lost we and i know we all turn pages and paper books it's easier with sections and pages to index things in one note and find your way back particularly in a science if you're thinking in that context your sections could be biology chemistry and physics it might be the units so that you break it into the biology units the chemistry units and so forth and whether you're using the codes from the exam board syllabus or the titles it's quite easy then for students to navigate that and find the information they've got from him within there you can see here in the sway that she's built she's not just used static pictures she's used some of the features like stacks to flick through photographs a bit like you're looking at that stack of photographs she's shown how they're making use of the devices as well as the digital platform and i know that not everybody has the luxury of budgets to afford flashy touchscreen tablets that can fold backwards or clamshell laptops but even if it's just you on the board at the front of the classroom using one note and working at that level with a with a class try and get someone to snap a picture of you doing that and get it here in your sway get it evidence so that you can show that also linking through to there was a video there about chemistry escape room when they did that and they had to use chemistry to fathom out how to get out of the classroom set up like a bit like a csi type scenario had they had to research it and get out but that was a video in stream so she's linking stream into her sway as well so that the microsoft team that are assessing these can go in there and have a look so make it as media rich as you possibly can uh, but don't forget to make it clear in there as well make it make it flow through your application sometimes you might have to signpost it to how it answers those three questions other times it might be from the, from the title it clearly is addressing one of the four questions anyway here there is the explanation about how it's being included in her classroom practice one of the things that laura got inspired by one of the links to the wider microsoft community is augmented reality and they only had a limited number of devices that were capable of augmented reality but what she did was try to bring that as much as possible into things like lesson starters or having a mini plenary in the middle of the lesson and when they were looking at the anatomy of the physi uh, of the physiology of the human body instead of getting the the cutout figure out where you can take all the organs out and lay them on the desk 
yes there's a place for that but probably they've seen that a few times as students over the years they held up the device and what she did with miracast on the board is she shared the ar experience of the organs inside the body but of course that is brought to life so you can see the heart pumping you can see the flow of blood through the aorta you can check the oxygenated blood against the deoxygenated blood you could pull with the ar certain organs out so all of this is creating that rich and engaging learning environment that we're talking about the fact it doesn't have to rely upon just putting static pictures in a one note you might use that as animated gifs you might record that sequence of learning and drop that as a video onto the page of the one note but make sure you're capturing all that detail there leading it through the journey and then she went back up and brought that back to the fact that Teams was being used for many things. Yes, they were using OneNote class notebook and class teams, but they were also using assignments as well and how effectively assignments were improving the homeworks that they were seeing returned. And I know one of the things that Laura focused on was was bringing depth of explanation to the assignments and also linking resources that supported students in working independently in the homework that may have been more difficult to do with giving them a piece of photocopied homework sheet or some questions that were stuck into a book and they had to fill that in and bring it back. So making the most of the possibilities that teams in OneNote presented to her was absolutely key in coming across. In here you can see an example of her wakelets and she included those wakelets in there. If we get time I might do a, a wakelet session for uh, when we move forwards but uh, wakelets are worth looking up as I said and there's some great MET courses in there. One of the other areas that she got really enthused about after Minecraft Education Edition was game-based learning game-based learning primarily through minecraft education edition but she didn't jump straight to using minecraft education edition it was let's understand game-based learning let's think about logical and sequential thinking let's think about algorithms and in, in what we might need to do to debug them and correct problems with those algorithms which also a really great life skills being able to think through something and break it down and understand where the problem is and think about a solution to fix that problem they're not just skills that are transfer are skills that are in the classroom they're transferable to life and again microsoft will be looking at things like that that wider deeper pedagogical thinking so we've also then come across to the fact that she captured that in the sway and moving down there was a little bit in there about coronavirus graphing in traditional ways not just going in and doing it in excel there was something, some work in there on coronavirus, and then it led down through into bringing in Minecraft Education Edition. And they didn't have a huge number of mobile devices that were powerful enough to run it. But what they did do is speak to their IT department, and they managed to get Minecraft Education Edition installed on the newest desktop computers in one of the IT suites. And then for part of one of the units, they went and used those devices there. So you can see in here, the, there's more stacks of photographs and you can flip through so that they've recreated the classroom there they've spoken about the learning journey and creating science experiments there in a virtual word inside of minecraft now you've got to make it meaningful and you've got to make it follow the curriculum and we will look at minecraft education edition when we progress through towards the second half of uh, of this course but Minecraft itself is an amazing resource and it can be used pretty much cross curricular. Uh, but think about it, try to include it, even if it's in a very small way. After we've covered the session, you can have a go at trying to include it, even if it's just building something uh, and it's a physical building project, you can include it. So do try to get Minecraft Education Edition in there. The next part of her application. If I scroll down, is growth of the colleagues. So this is where she clearly illustrated working across the school as a wider community, then branching out from working as a as a cluster of individuals, thinking about how they are going to take that and then scale it up how they could become the digital ambassadors in their school that lead that transformation, how they could showcase this to the leadership team to show just the, the positive response. 
one thing they found that was very positive was the response from the students. Now, I know recently we've been through a pandemic and during that pandemic, the students have been distanced learning to death uh, in that they may not want to see teams a lot at the moment, but it could be that there are certain elements that still remain useful. One of the things that I was speaking about in a training session I ran yesterday, that assignments can be, still be very useful. It doesn't have all the functions at the moment of some of those paid platforms, although it's getting there. Things like parental engagement will come in the near future. But it also could be the cost savings. If, for instance, the subscription to the distance learning platform, so the, the homework platform is split across different cost centres for subjects in a school, and then all of a sudden those subjects start to find other ways of working and you can get around not having to use that, you might be able to save that money and get it allocated back to your department to spend on other other things so do talk about those bigger picture aspects as well as the impact in your classroom or the impact of working with, with the schools and from memory i think they went and worked with other colleagues in other core subjects first i believe it was maths from memory but they they really did begin to bring about that change one of the other areas they dabbled in is that laura got involved with a uh, community around her and she went out to some other meetings network meetings and other schools uh, and they started to look at microsoft make code so the micro bit as you can see from the picture on the right hand side it's a really simple device but you can do some quite creative things with it so make code is another initiative from microsoft and you can program those micro bits to do all sorts of things or join sensors up to them to get them to react in different ways so you can either buy the base micro bit uh, and just program that and build the algorithm on the computer, transfer it over to the micro bit uh, and do things with the LEDs or the sensors that are built into it, or you can buy additional sensor packs to use from there as well. Because this was prior to the pandemic establishing itself, Laura did talk about how it was transferable to remote learning. Uh, and that also was something that she was trying to showcase in that instance. The final bit I will show you before Nick jumps in and takes over was using Flipgrid and it was something she was dabbling with towards the end of her application but she was trying to show how Flipgrid could be used to build community uh, and also how Flipgrid was a powerful tool to give voice to pupils. Uh, and it's not just pupils and students. I've seen schools recently successfully engaging in voice for parents, talking about possible changes to the school uh, and then using that to capture feedback. I've also seen another school that decided to rework the school day and the way the lunch system was going to function. And that was another vehicle for using Flipgrid. So don't think that Flipgrid can only be used in the classroom. It can be used for, for wider practice as well. So if I just quickly jump back over to the timetable, think about for your application evidence using Teams, include that OneNote class notebook, Microsoft Education Edition. You will be using Sway by virtue of putting in your submission. Uh, but do think about if you don't do that in a video, talk about that. You can also think about forms and collecting data. Microsoft, you'd like to see how you are using that data. Are you using it to inform your practice or helping to improve the school? Then think about at the end that wider Microsoft 365 stack, Microsoft Education Edition, and looking at things like Flip, Flipgrid and Wakelet and so forth, and get all of that into your application. At this point, I am going to stop because I believe Nick has just joined. So, Nick, welcome along. And for those of you that haven't met Nick before, he is inspirational. And I'm, I'm not trying to big him up too much, but I've worked with him on many occasions and, and, I've had, and it's always been great. He is somebody that's got a great deal of experience in this field and he has got an awful lot to share. So, Nick, without any further delay, I'm going to pass over to you to talk about the journey of being an MIE, talking about the wider Office 365 and M6365 and talk about impact that you can have in the role of being an MIEE and where it's led you. Thanks, Martin. Uh, it's really nice to be here. Uh, you, you have rather big me up too much. Um, I was, uh, I, I guess, just a teacher who got quite lucky. Um, I don't know if I'm lucky or not. Um, hopefully you have all decided to become MIEs and certainly that's it's a really interesting thing to do and it's kind of what got me onto the path that I'm on now 
Um, I've slightly strayed away from that in the last few weeks, but I'll, I'll explain that. Um, and hopefully you've got lots of questions. Um, you know, please do ask. But my my background was or is that I was a teacher for 14 years as a primary teacher for 14 years uh, and worked in lots of schools. Um, two two main schools. I worked in a really rural village school in Bissom um, for a long time, uh, and then I worked in a really big inner city. Um, uh, school in Bracknell, which was uh, very interesting, full form entry primary school um, with uh, a lot of challenges. Um, and I was deputy deputy head there and deputy head at Bissom for, for a few years, but was always obsessed with uh, technology. And, and in the first instance, I um, helped lots of schools go Google um, because at that time, Google was by far the best platform to do anything. If you wanted to teach using technology, uh, Google was the best platform to use. Uh, Microsoft had a few bits of bits of technology that vaguely fitted together and sort of ground to a halt every now and again. They had Outlook and they had something called Live Drive, which was eventually OneDrive and things like that, and a bit of SharePoint, which was all pretty horrific. So it wasn't really a big decision for me or for any of the schools that I helped to go to Google. But um, eventually, Microsoft got a bit better, um, and I was. Uh, interested in that and I, 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 a random chain of events helped me to kind of uh, get into that that uh, kind of Microsoft way of thinking I guess um, and the first one was that I uh, had a demo of Office 365 as it stood at a show and I was a really staunch Google person I was absolutely uh, you know when I wrote Microsoft it was M and a dollar uh, you know because I, I despised them so much um, but somebody gave me a, a demo of Office 365 and I thought ah oh, that's quite interesting that is interesting because it has a few killer apps and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about those in a sec because I think for me there is some killer stuff in Office 365 that sets it apart a lot uh, both from an educational and a kind of teacher organization school point of view from things like Google and Google's not bad uh, I don't uh, I'm not one of these people who wants to come into any any one particular camp um, but I think Microsoft has the edge for two or three different reasons and I'll explain those in a second and hopefully you can you can agree and and uh, challenge me um, uh, or, or one or the other you'd have to do both um, but so I, I saw this and I thought this looks interesting I'd like to switch a school to this which I which I did um, and I had the technical ability at that time I've completely lost it since to, to do that um, and it worked really well and I helped a few other schools and then at that time the MIE program was was kind of just about out so I applied and became an MIE um, and through that um, I got involved in Microsoft and was at was at bet with them um, it's a really interesting experience if you go to bet with Microsoft um, they look after you very well and uh, I met a guy called Mark Reynolds who said ah I've uh, I've just left Microsoft and I've set up a company that aims to help uh, educators uh, mostly in, in private schools actually but I will also explain that in a second as well um, to do really well with technology uh, but crucially from a people point of view and not a tech point of view and that is the whole basis of my interest in technology I like technology for the sake of it because I am a geek uh, but the interest for me has become this um, idea that technology is no use without the people. Um, and we all know that, but sometimes we get hung up um, on this, this kind of technology for the sake of it or using bits of technology in the classroom. And I think potentially that is where Microsoft has the edge at the moment. And, and hopefully you, you know, you're, you're wanting to become MIE. So hopefully that's, that's something that, that, that you realize too, and you're starting to use these things in your classes. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. And I, I've worked for Hable um, and Turn It On. So I, I, I set up my own business. Uh, I left teaching. I, I contracted for Hable and Microsoft and Turn It On as well. And if any of you are from the Great Learners Trust, I can't see if you are or not. There, you, there looks to be a few. I wonder if Charlie, if you're from the Great Learners Trust or not. But I recognise your name. Um, but if you're from the Great Learners Trust, you will have uh, you will have met, maybe met me before in some of the training sessions that we've done, uh, or some of the kind of uh, the consultancy stuff that I've done with them as well. Um, and I've had the benefit of working with a huge number of schools, universities, education institutions across uh, Europe. And really, that's my only benefit. Uh, I don't have any more than that. Um, but 
what I have seen in those seven years, and I work from Hable right from the beginning, there were three of us and I, I have just left, uh, it's a very painful process, um, that there are certain bits of Microsoft tools that make a massive difference to the way that education works and have the edge over uh, tools like Google and those things, which still have their place and they're still good tools. But if you use them well, um, there are, I, I think, two main features of Office 365. One of those is OneNote. Um, OneNote for me was my way into Microsoft. So I started using OneNote as soon as I kind of made that switch from wanting to find open source alternatives and Google and those kind of things to using OneNote. And I used it, I taught year three and four almost exclusively throughout my 14 years of, uh, of teaching. And I use OneNote class notebook with year three and year four. I had lots of mixed classes and eventually a, a bit of both. Um, and we noticed in those classes that the kind of uptake, uh, the kind of attention span, the way that that worked, worked beautifully. Even if it was just me using OneNote at the front of the classroom and they could get that at home later on. For me, OneNote class notebook is a massive part of Office 365. And if you haven't started to look at it, if you haven't made use of that yet, um, I would really encourage you to do so. If, if you'd like me to, I, I'm happy to show you some of the, the OneNote notebooks that, that, that uh, or you know, show you around it if that's useful. I don't want to show you stuff that you already know. Um, but for me, OneNote class notebook and OneNote on its own are the, uh, is, is the one thing that for me, Google does not have and nobody else has this ability to use it on a big screen at the front of your classroom. And if you're lucky enough to have uh, tablets, some kind of technology for your kids in your classroom, then that's great too. They can sit there and they can join in and they can collaborate on that. But we didn't uh, in the time that I taught. I I've worked with lots of schools and I can talk about them in a sec who do. Uh, and I've seen massive dividends paid by having that. But for me, the ability for my students in my you know reasonably deprived area of Bracknell to go home and open up one note on their parents phones or their computer if they had one to see what we did during that day made a massive difference um, a real marked difference to how they remembered the stuff and how they worked on it and we didn't use it to its full potential because we didn't have classroom based devices but we used it whenever we, we use an ICT suite and on all of those things so that was and still is, I think, the most amazing thing in Office 365 uh, and quite rightly the thing that they talk about the most. It is not perfect um, and, and I can show you the bits that are not perfect, um, but no software is, is, is perfect. Um, so if, if you're looking for somewhere to go next and you've tried it, all the other stuff, OneNote Class Notebook, it's very different to the rest of uh, you know, the Office 365 set of tools. It's old. It's been around since 2002. Um, uh, so so it's, it's pretty old but it's been integrated into Teams and it's gonna get more integrated into Teams. Um, and that's where a lot of our customers have, have, have started. They have decided to use OneNote Class Notebook first and then started to delve into things like Teams and the other tools that live inside there. So for me, the thing that gives Office 365 its edge in education is OneNote Class Notebook. If you're looking for somewhere to go then please do go there. I'm really happy to, to show you some of that if, if you'd like to. Some of my favourite bits of that um, are quite small tools, but things that have helped me and I have seen help schools that I that I work with. And perhaps I'll show you a few of those in a sec. Um, the other one is Teams. Um, it's 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 been around for for nearly five years now, maybe four years, four and a half, five years. Um, but Teams for Education. Uh, I think is, is under publicized. Google are really good at the kind of glossy publication. Well, it's Google Classroom. It just works like this. It's a bit like your normal classroom. It, it does all these things. Whereas Teams takes, I think, a little bit more learning. Um, but Teams does have Class Notebook built in. It has all of those other tools like assessments and homework and those kinds of things, as well as eventually things for parents built in. And those two tools, have I, I have seen make massive difference, especially over lockdown. Um, and I'll tell you the story of, of the school I've worked with the most in, in, in a second, um, which, which I think is genuine transformation. Lots of people talk about digital transformation, but I think the one that I've seen do it best uh, is, is, is this school. Um, and that's uh, it's a private school, but please don't take take offense to that. Lots of lots of lots of people I talk to say, well, it's a private school. They, they can do that. Um, but private schools are interesting because 
they have to do these things because if they don't do these things, they don't get paid. So when lockdown happened, I was working with Bradfield College and I've been working for them for a couple with them for a, for a couple of years. They decided to start with OneNote. We tried to press them to start with Teams, but they decided to start with OneNote because they could see how similar that was to pencils and paper, which is where they had come from, obviously. Um, and I, I remember they were a really hard bunch of people to, to work with. Um, everything that you know about private schools is true. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of very old teachers there who don't want to change. There's a lot of very old subjects that don't lend themselves very easily to technology, especially sort of music, the arts. They take a bit more of a creative approach to make them really good at, uh, you know, on online learning or, or in any way digital. Um, and there were some really reluctant people. Um, there was a guy who walked out of one of my sessions uh, and threw the stuff on the floor and said he was never going to be doing this because it just wasn't useful for PE. Um, and it, it kind of carried on like that. But then the first lockdown happened and they had to get good at something very, very quickly. They had to move to teams and, and we helped them a lot. I remember that was my last on-site day. It's still my last on-site day, really sadly, was last March on a Saturday at Bradfield College. Um, and they got good at teams very quickly. Um, and the transformation that has happened because they have got good at teams and they've got good at one note class notebook, I think is 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 an is a, is a proper real transformation. They have gone from not using Teams at all before last March to massive use of Teams. Every classroom has 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 a team. Every class has a team. Every class has a class notebook. Most of the things they do are digital, and now they're back. They are still using those tools um, to make the most of their curriculum. And that guy, by the way, who walked out of my session, he's a PE teacher and had been there for twenty five years. Um, he came to one of the later sessions and I thought, oh God, here we go. And he said, actually, can I just tell you about the stuff that we've been doing in PE over lockdown by putting videos into Class Notebook and to Teams and getting students to send send videos back using, and I, I caught the tail end of this when I was coming in, like uh, Flipgrid, as, as Martin was talking about. They're now starting to move towards things like Flipgrid for video you know, video uh, lessons and those kind of things or, or getting, you know, getting information back from their students. Uh, and he said, it's, abs it's been absolutely brilliant. We've been able to post hit workouts for our students online. They've posted videos of how they've been doing these exercises back. We've given feedback. We've given them assignments and homework and we've been able to do everything that we need to do. Of course, it's not face to face, but he said, we'll keep those hit workouts and we'll keep them on Teams and we'll augment our, our physical in-person stuff. Uh, and he said, well, I was wrong. You know, I, 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 I now understand the, the kind of the, the way that we should have we should have been. We should have gone with this. Um, and I know they're a private school. <clears throat> there are many other schools. There's, there's a couple of trusts that I work with who are well on their way to being really good at those things. Um, but if you take the fact that they're a private school away, that's proper digital transformation. And that for me is, is absolutely amazing because you can see the, the progress that they have made and how they have just integrated technology. And that's a hard thing to do. Um, I don't think it's done, it, 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 you know, it, well, it, it's just a hard thing to do. Um, but I think if you're looking at, at ways of doing that, becoming a me can help you to do that. And certainly if you're looking to, to, to build a career that involves teaching and technology, um, I think it's a really good place to start. It's a way of getting not noticed by, by Microsoft. Um, one of the things I, I, I learned the other day, actually, from uh, a colleague of mine is that the UK schools market for Microsoft is really, really important um, for, for two main reasons. One, they really value UK teachers. They think that they are very well qualified and very professional, but also um, they have a much bigger presence of their tools in use in UK schools than they do in the US percentage wise in the US. Most people use Canvas, which is not used here apart from really in universities. There's a few schools that might use it um, and they have Google Classroom and most schools in the US use one of those two tools. And even though Microsoft is a US company, they find it really difficult to break into that. So the UK education market for Microsoft, they see as really transformative and really interesting as a way of, of kind of, um, you know, sharing best practice. Um, and certainly as, as, a, as a me, I went, I don't know whether it was because I was a me, but certainly being being one of them helped. Um, 
I went to various countries. I went to Georgia to talk about the, you know, the, 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 the way that they might set up a program like this and get good at Teams and OneNote and, and all of those things. Uh, they were really interesting because they have a really distributed school model. They don't have broadband. Uh, they have mobile broadband and they're investing massively in that. Um, so they're really interesting sort of distance learning opportunities. And they want UK people because they 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 feel that we've had good experience and that we are professionally trained. And then if you're if you've got the technology experience, I think that is a really invaluable thing. Um, so if you're, you know, I, I understand from from a really brief conversation with Martin that, that we've been uh, that, that you guys are on your way to becoming uh, uh, Microsoft education experts. Um, I think it's it's worth doing. And if, if you have any questions or anything you want to see or anything from your point of view, then I'm, I'm, that's what I'm here for, really, really for the next 15 or 20 minutes. Um, if you want to see any of the technology, I'm, I'm really happy to show it to you or if you want to ask questions or, or whatever, really. Um, does that give enough of an introduction, Martin? Uh, it's good, yes. yes. Sorry, as I'm stuttering, I think my broadband's playing up as well. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. That's extremely good. Uh, and a great setting of the scene. Has anybody here got anything they wish to ask Nick or anything you'd like to see him show you? If not, I know I've got a question. Silence. And Minecraft, of course. Yeah, Minecraft education. I've, I've weirdly met Martin in person, which is uh, which is obviously not allowed in that place, uh, on, a, on a Minecraft course. Um, so. You know, and Microsoft are recruiting massively for Minecraft in education at the moment. Um, so, you know, there, there are there are lots of opportunities, I think, in 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 ed tech um, at the moment. And certainly, if you go in, so I, I have just changed my job, and I don't know whether it's a good idea or not. But I, but I got offered a job uh, with a company called Iris, who makes an MIS system. And certainly, as soon as you say I was a teacher and I've got this technology experience, that opens a, a huge number of doors that I never expected to be to be open, really. I'd agree. Having trod a similar pathway and coming out of 14 years in education myself, it, it, it does open a lot of doors. People's ears prick up and they think, oh, OK, so they do know what they're talking about. They understand where we're coming from uh, and they can actually contextualise this and help me to be get better at whatever I'm trying to achieve or bring about transformation. Nick, if people are if people haven't got any questions, and I don't want to dominate the two areas that I think probably would be useful from the questions that I've been sent privately or we might have a question there, it is seeing a little bit of how you've used OneNote and also if you have got it open and it's installed, a little bit of Minecraft Education Edition, but if you haven't, don't worry, we are going to do that later on, but certainly could we start with OneNote? Yeah, I don't have Minecraft Education Edition. I should have, but I don't. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry about that. That's all right. Let's go with OneNote. I think there's a question in the chat as well. Yeah, let's have OneNote. The most, the most underrated. I'm just trying to think. Um, let me have a little think while I crank up one note. Um, the one I can tell you but while I'm thinking about that, the one that I dislike, I probably shouldn't say, the one that I dislike the most is Sway. And I don't know, am I allowed to say that, Martin? You are allowed to say that. It's it's a Marmite experience with Sway. <laughs> it really is. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure about it, to be honest. Um, I have a feeling that Microsoft might get rid of it. Um, I don't know if uh, if you have an opinion on that, because I, I think it's it's... Yeah, it, its functionality is disappearing quietly into um, into PowerPoint. And there's lots of things that you can now do in PowerPoint, like the kind of design stuff that comes from Sway. So I wonder if that's going to disappear. But I know there's lots of people who really like it. Um, I don't know why, really, but, um, but yeah. <laughs> I, I think I the, the times I find it most useful is in the classroom when I, I maybe I just need a quick fix for students or pupils to to get something together and the fact they can pop some content in and easily remix it or get a different flow with the storyboards and in the cards yeah that's probably where I found most use for it uh, and I have got some schools which have moved to doing their newsletters on it and absolutely love it and refuse to, to go anywhere else now for their newsletters so I do see different roles for it depending on their the person in the school so I think the two apps that are, well, there's a couple that are maybe underrated. I think Forms, um, yes, good old Microsoft Forms, I think is probably the most useful app in Office 365. Um, the other one that you might want to try, and this is more of a, this is this less to use with students, but more to use with your colleagues um, for building information stores, is Lists. Um, and that lives in Office 365. You can find it in all apps. 
Um, it works in teams so you can share it and it works as, a, as an individual that you can share. But essentially what List does is what you would do on all of those shared spreadsheets that come your way. And I know there are lots in schools, you know, can you just fill in your results in this spreadsheet? Can you, you know, meal choices, trips, maybe one day uh, if, we're, if we're lucky, but lists build a database of those without needing any actual input from you. So we log in and we can do it straight from Office 365 or we can do it from Teams. The only difference is if you do it in Teams, it's shared with the people in that team already, which is probably what you might want. And we simply build a list and it gives you all these little templates. So we can say, well, we need an issue tracker, event itinerary and asset manager, content scheduler, work progress or whatever, um, or recruitment, or you can tweak these. Or you can say, well, I've got an Excel tracking sheet that I use for tracking attendance at a lunchtime club or for tracking um, results from a particular subject or a particular thing, I want to import that. So you can bring your Excel spreadsheets in. But what Lists does is A, keeps that in a database rather than a spreadsheet. Therefore, it's easier for you and your colleagues to fill in. But if I just go for a, one that's already built, we can change this. We just use the template, that's fine. Work progress tracker. Um, and we all just give it a give it a name there. There we go. And all it does is it populates these cat these uh, these columns for us. Um, you provide the rows just like a spreadsheet, nothing different about it. But when you put your columns in and you can change these at any time, so this could be level, it could be, you know, description of what work has been done by a student or, or you know, tracking an issue of, a, of a, you know, building maintenance or something in your school. We add a new entry to that, but Lists has gone off and built me a form so that I don't have to bother doing that. So rather than me having to build forms that go on top of spreadsheets or asking people to fill in the raw data in the spreadsheet, I can keep my data in a list in Office 365 without any fuss at all. And it builds forms. It can also instantly report on trends, on information that's held in that list. Um, it's incredible. So Essentially, whatever you would normally use a spreadsheet for to collect or capture data, think about using lists for either individually, you can just keep it for yourself, or you can share it with one or two other people, or you can share it in a team and therefore it becomes accessible as almost an app in that team. You can export that data to a spreadsheet if you need to, or you can you can do analysis on it. You can you can sort it and tweak it and report on it and show trends and those kinds of things. All from either importing a spreadsheet or just setting up a number of columns across the top and it's colorful and it looks nice um, and it builds all of this for you so i think um, the most underrated is forms but the most up and coming i think is lists and i think schools can make use of this massively especially if they're in teams there's no reason you can't use this with your with your with your students um, it, i suspect hits a number of uh, curricular objectives but also a way of tracking what they've done and a way of asking them questions and a way of getting them to fill in forms. And it's different to the way that Microsoft Forms works because Microsoft Forms allows you to do a huge amount of um, you know, different types of questions and those kinds of things. And it goes into a spreadsheet or it gets kept inside the form. This gets kept in a list. So it's more about the kind of ongoing data that, kept, that gets kept in here. So you've effectively got two form based tools in your in your little in your arsenal. Forms is great for externals as well. So you can survey parents and things like that. But I think this is really good for collecting, storing, sorting, presenting data. Um, and if you get really good at it, you could use something like Power BI to take the data and visualize it in all kinds of graphs and things like that. That is not beyond the realms of a normal person either. So certainly I think lists could be a really good app. OK, I would say with oh, lists as well, I use the mobile app quite a bit. Sorry, Nick, uh, I've got oh, it on my phone and I use it that way. Brilliant. So this is this is one note for Windows 10. Um, and this is just a, a, a random year for notebook that I've got. Um, and I'll show you my my highlights. I know we've only got another 10 minutes or so, but um, I'm happy to 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 talk as long as you want me to. Um, OneNote lives it lives best in teams. OK, so you, there, there's some ground rules for this to make it work really, really well. OneNote class notebook works really well if you set it up in teams. So go to teams, set up your class in a team, click the class notebook tab and just go through the steps to set it up. 
That way, it lives in the team in the cloud, so you'd have no worries about where it actually is. It's in the it's in the cloud. We don't need to worry about anything else. That's where it is. Then, um, perversely, the online version is OK. It's not great. And especially when you're in Teams, it kind of squeezes itself into that little window that's on the right hand side of Teams, which is not great, not ideal uh, and certainly not good for what OneNote is really good at, which is you know taking up a lot of space and showing you a kind of canvas type view. So your best bet is to open it in OneNote for Windows 10. Sadly, there are a couple of other old versions that will probably be installed on your computer where you'll see the these colored tabs will be across the top of your screen. I would encourage you to use OneNote for Windows 10 because it, it is the one that's going to get the most love going forward. There is a OneNote 2016, 2019, but that it is it is old. Uh, it is not being developed anymore. So I would always go for the one with the tabs, the little colors down the left hand side. All right. And essentially, if you've not used it before, it's very much like a lever arch file crossed with a file fax. Um, and I say crossed with a file fax because in lever arch files, you tend to have just sort of boring bits of paper and stuff like that. But with OneNote, it's anything but. We still have these lovely colored tabs down the side, and I'm just going to collapse all of this so I can show you how this works. But we also have inside those colored tabs pages that will accept, and this is the real key, any kind of content, literally anything at all, from video to attachments of files, to drawing, to text, to maths input, to Microsoft Forms, dictated text, um, audio feedback, anything like that is goes here. And you have these three main sections. We have a collaboration space, which is essentially a free for all for you and your pupils. All right, so in group work, I might split my students up into groups and say, right, group one, you're off over here, group two, group three. It's like sending your little groups of your class off to different corners of the classroom with a very big bit of paper. It's a free for all. You will see the initials of the students who are writing on this page in real time. So have this on your board at the front of the classroom, um, you know, and, and 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 work on it that way. We then have a content library, which I normally have whiteboards in for that week or for that term, and then the kind of stuff that I'm teaching for that week. Um, in the content library, students cannot edit; they can view. So this is where you know I've got my whiteboards here. Um, you know, I've got some space stuff on here um, ready to go. I'll show you how to put all this in a second. I'll do more. Um, this stuff my students can see later on so they can see what I'm writing on the whiteboard, but they can see this later on. All right, so I can easily use my math template, grab my stylus or my uh, pen from my board and start to, you know, write equations, those kinds of things. Sorry, it's a very big pen. I could then lasso that, draw around it with my pen, and I should be able to say maths. Turn that into maths. There we go, ink to maths. It's recognized my equation there, not perfectly, but it's not bad. Um, so I can recognize maths functions, but I can also do ink to text. All this from my whiteboard or from a, any computer. iPad Pro, it's a really good version of OneNote for iPad Pro. Sorry, I should have changed my thickness of my pen. Let's just change that. My terrible handwriting should get picked up. I'll just lasso that. So you just draw around it with your pen and then say ink to text. There we go. This is ink. And it'll even keep the color and the size and those things. I found actually ink to text was not that useful. I much preferred to write on the board and my students could then understand what I had written. All of that immediately synchronized to every student in the classroom. They can see it, but they can't mess around with it. All right, so that's your content library. The other space you have self-explanatory is a teacher only section, and I would use this as my little library. So I'd say, OK, well, I've got my planning for term one in there. I've got evidence of work, but I've also got assignments in there. And maybe I've got upcoming resources that I don't want to publish in the content library just yet. That, that could go there too. All right, um, and I could move evidence in there and, and those kinds of things and all of that stuff. And here's, here's, here's something that we did earlier where, um, you know, some of my students, you can see their initials there, have 
written things on this uh, on this group work and I put it in work evidence by just dragging and dropping. So underneath that, we then have all of our students. These are all the students in my class. You can see that Dennis is bold because he's actually done some work and you can see it's in handouts. Um, but my students, I can control. As I add students and take them away from my team, they get added to OneNote class note, but they don't get removed when they're taken out of the team, by the way, so you keep their work. But I can send work to my students and collect it back. I can mark it and give it back to them and all those kinds of things straight from OneNote class notebook. It's really, really easy. Um, and I do that by clicking class notebook. Um, if you're using it through Teams, which is my absolute suggestion, ignore these last four buttons. You don't need to have anything to do with those because it's being managed in Teams. Then you've got distribute stuff. Well, let's grab and create a page that I want to distribute. So I've got my space module here. Um, my, my space resources pack. Let me collapse that. Yeah, this is what I want to send out to my students. So I want to give them their own copy. Distribute page, distribute page. There are other options here as well, but uh, hopefully they're relatively self-explanatory and they're certainly uh, a little bit too quick. Distribute page and it says, OK, where do you want to send it to? It goes off, picks up all the sections that are in your students notebooks and say, OK, well, I want to put it in handout. It's not homework, but it's a handout. There we go. A few seconds later. It should be happily distributed and you'll see it appear in your students sections. Uh, the general rule is if you want it to happen quickly because you've forgotten to do it, it will take 10 minutes. If you don't need it to happen quickly, it will be done within 20 seconds. Uh, that's generally that's generally the rule with one though. It knows if you're in a hurry. Um, you can see it's just spinning through that now. So eventually I'll see that pop up in my students. Section. It's been sent to handouts, so let me leave that running. If I go back over here. I bet it won't appear yet, but we'll see. No, not yet. Oh, there we go. There we go. Dennis has got it. You can see the pages haven't quite appeared. There we go. That's Dennis's copy of that work. And I could say great. Well, I've sent that out to Dennis. That's all good. I'm going to leave them for a week and then I'm going to collect them back in. I want to review their work. So I said, OK, review student work, review student work. And it says, OK, where is that work? Uh, it was in handouts, wasn't it? Or maybe it was in homework. I could have a look and see what's there. I haven't said anything for homework, so I'll go back and I'll grab this one. There we go. Space resources pack or the article. And I'll say OK, next. And it says, OK, there's the list of your students. Would you like to lock their pages so they can't do any work while you're marking them? Yes or no? And I'll go through and I'll say, OK, well, where's um, where's Dennis? Because he's the one who's actually done any work. There we go. And here's Dennis's work. I can collapse that at any time and I can say, well, here's here's his um, here's his work and I can mark that and he will see that once I release it to him by unlocking the page. Really, really simple stuff. OK, but a really good way of creatively the thing with one though i mean there are many tools like show my homework and assessments and assignments in teams where you can set work and mark it one note gives you this wonderful open-ended way of being able to do that for art for music for anything at all you can easily do that and if i was marking somebody's work i can do that in a number of ways and this will be the last last couple of things i'll show you and i'll let you uh, disappear um I can use dictation. Hopefully you've all had a go at this. It works really, really well. It works nicely on OneNote. For some reason, I find it works OneNote works in OneNote on the desktop really well and also online in the online versions of the tools really well. It's a bit slow in, in others, but it's not too bad. Full stop. There we go. And once I've got a bit of text, so I could give feedback by dictation and I could then copy that out. So if you don't have a uh, an MIS with uh, a dictation tool in it, you write your reports here, copy it out, stick it in your reports rather than having to type them uh, glued to Sims or whatever you use. Um, otherwise, though, I can mark it with a pen. Oops, it'd help me if I choose the right pen. We go mark it with a pen or and this is my favorite thing ever in um, OneNote I can leave audio feedback but not just any audio feedback so I can start on audio feedback and it'll record what I say or it should do sometimes it picks up the wrong microphone um, 
But as I'm recording that audio, and you can see that the file just appears on the page here for the student to click on, and they'll see a little play button next to it. But if I grab myself, and I can do this with a stylus or I can do it with my mouse. If, I've got, if you've got a stylus in your hand, use, use that. If not, use the mouse. But I can say, brilliant. OK, well, let's go through while I'm talking, while I'm talking to Dennis here about his work. Let's go through and just say, well, actually, this um, this first sentence, I'm not quite sure. Doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. So let me just highlight that bit. Um, and this this last bit here I thought was 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 really good. And I'll just put a ring around that. So I've made a couple of marks on there. I'll go back. Uh, I'll stop my recording. That's great. There we go. Dennis can play my recording. And it works. You probably can't hear that because my team audio seems to be not. Um, but. While I was talking, I left a couple of marks on Dennis's work. If I go back and hover over them, can you see there's a tiny play button just next to where I made that yellow mark and another one just next to where I ringed his work literally on the on there. And what that does is allows Dennis. Say, oh, well, Mr. Clark, he's left a little audio note about this bit as he wrote it. And I can literally play from that point to my students and you can say, right, tell me what Nick said at this point really easily. And that starts the audio recording at exactly the point that I press that little play button. And for me, that's an amazing feature. Uh, my, ki my kids in my class loved it because they could easily just see. Ah, yeah, that's a bit of feedback that goes with that bit of work. Really powerful stuff. And there's loads of lovely little things in here. So it's open ended any kind of uh, text, video, images, anything at all that you can put in here. So if you've not had a go um, and have avoided using it, have a little pilot with some of your students. It works on any device, doesn't have to be PC. PC version is quite advanced. The iOS and Android versions are also pretty good and it works on uh, phones as well and the Mac. So it is pretty, pretty well, well supported. And there's a web version if you get desperate. All right, but uh, you know, this is a really important product for Microsoft. It's been around for a very long time. If you want people to follow, um, go and follow Mike Tolson on Twitter. He's the product manager for OneNote worldwide. Uh, he goes everywhere wearing purple and a cape. Uh, he's obsessed with OneNote, um, but he has some really good tips around Teams and OneNote um, and is a really interesting guy to follow. So if you want kind of the, that Microsoft insider's view of what's what's going on with OneNote and, and a bit of Teams, follow him. Um, so yeah, that that's in a nutshell, that's a few things that OneNote does. So, you know, it's a really creative, interesting, uh, interesting tool. I don't know how long I've got left to talk, Martin, but uh, I think that's you've, got, probably... you've got about five minutes, Nick. There's another question in the chat asking what? about getting meeting minutes. I know a feature in Teams that I'd recommend, but I just wanted to see what you would say first. Yeah, so uh, Charlie, is there an app that takes me minutes in meetings? Yeah, I think there's two ways to do that. If you're in a Teams meeting, you can now press the three dots and say start transcription and it will transcribe everything that is said and it will attribute that to what Martin said, what I said and how that worked. However, if you're lucky enough to be in person somewhere, if you go to office and let me just go home, the same tool, by the way, that transcription tool that transcribes in Teams meetings that does dictation is the same tool across the whole suite. But if I go to a Word document and it needs to be Word online, there's a new feature, cloud only. So it, it, most of the new stuff will come here first, which is a good reason to come here. Just next to dictate, there's a tiny little drop down button. If you're in a meeting, maybe you've got your phone with you and you've stuck it on the table and you've recorded an MP3 version of that meeting. Great, that's fine. Or you've got your laptop with Word online and you want to do it live. Either way, we can hit transcribe. So tap transcribe and you can either upload your MP3 or you can start recording. And if I start recording, it will record what is said in that room. It's rubbish over Teams, so use the Teams transcription tool, same tool, but works better over Teams. And it just records what's going on in that room. Um, and then when you press save and transcribe, it goes off, analyzes the audio and 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 there we go. You can see it's only me that spoke, so I'll say speaker one is called Nick. And I'll change all that to speaker one because that's all me. There we go. So I could, you know, I could be in a room with Martin and 30 other people, 
and it would give them all a speaker number but i could then go through and say oh that was that was martin that was charlie we can easily tag them and then i can easily dump the whole thing into my document and that could be a long meeting with names times and your original audio recording as well i think that's a really powerful tool could be really good for staff meetings and, and things like that where you don't want to always have to take notes does that help I hope it does. I've got another question there from Luke for you. Oh, yeah. Can kids also use? Yes, absolutely. Everything that you saw that I did as the teacher is not restricted to the teacher, apart from the uh, pushing pages and pulling pages um, out works works well. And yes, they, they can use that to dictate and to tag their, their, their audio as well. So if they were self marking a bit of work, they could go and give themselves some feedback. And they could, you know, it, it would tag that. So many possibilities. Thank you, Nick. Any other questions? See Luke's typing something. No, it's great. Any other questions at all before we conclude? No, <laughs> definitely two greats. Can I just, uh, unless there's any other questions, I'm going to bring things to a conclusion. No, I think everyone's uh, it questioned that. Nick, thank you so much coming along and also going through those areas it, it's so powerful as a suite uh, and i agree with you i i'm agnostic at turn it on uh, and we work with both companies but i do i do find that the edge is with microsoft and the tools that you've got to hand are far more powerful and yeah i think you said it though it can be sometimes more challenging to grapple with how to get to use them and understand what they can do once you are using them it's pretty much limitless as to where you can go with it and there's always wonderful new features being added at the same time yeah so yeah and go and check out the roadmap so microsoft published their roadmap as well just just google office 365 roadmap for education and you'll see really granularly with some time scales what's coming soon so you can get a handle on well that looks really exciting i, I might want to use that and start to plan for it and those are the kind of things that as a, as, a, as, a, as a me, you'll get inside access to potentially. There's a lovely Microsoft community that you'll get access to in Teams, which is really active, looked after by Alan Crawford from Microsoft, who used to be a teacher at a real school, uh, so understands how, how we all work, um, where you can go and get questions answered and, and find information and join events and all that kind of stuff. So you really get the inside running as well as opportunities uh, you know, for, for later on. Uh, and Microsoft are rubbish at publicizing what all this stuff does because it's business first and so is Google. But yeah, Google seemed to have this kind of real clarity around, oh, it's Google Classroom. I know it does these things. Microsoft doesn't have that, but it does everything and more, I think, than than, than Google does. I'd concur. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nick. No uh, if there's anything else, I will draw the session to a close. Thank you for everybody that has come and gone because there's no few people who have joined and left, but the recording will also be available online afterwards on our YouTube channel. So thank you, Nick. It's been great to see you again, even if it's only over Teams. I really appreciate you coming along today. Thank you very much. We'll see you soon. Cheers. See you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.